Good morning. Today we are addressing one of the most frequently utilized yet commonly misunderstood biomarkers in acute care, blood lactate. While we often treat an elevated lactate level as a definitive signal of tissue hypoxia, the reality of cellular metabolism is far more nuanced. Relying on lactate as a simple distress signal for oxygen debt can lead to significant management errors. This lecture will examine the physiological drivers of hyperlactatemia and the clinical pitfalls that can cloud our judgment. Introduction The Pathophysiology of Lactate Production To interpret lactate accurately, we must first look at its biochemical origins. Lactate is the end product of glycolysis. Under normal conditions, pyruvate enters the mitochondria to undergo oxidative phosphorylation. When oxygen is scarce, a state we define as type A hyperlactatemia, the cell shifts to anaerobic metabolism to maintain adenosine triphosphate production, resulting in lactate accumulation. However, we must also recognize type B hyperlactatemia, where oxygen delivery is adequate, but cellular machinery or clearance mechanisms are impaired. In the critically ill, these two states often overlap. Understanding that lactate is a product of metabolic rate and not just oxygen lack is the first step toward better clinical application. Pitfall number one, the misinterpretation of non-hypoxic triggers. The most frequent error in the intensive care unit is the failure to consider non-hypoxic causes of increased lactate. One primary driver is enhanced glycolysis mediated by beta-2 adrenergic stimulation. When we administer exogenous catecholamines like epinephrine or frequent albuterol treatments, we stimulate the sodium-potassium adenosine triphosphatase pump. This acceleration of the glycolytic pathway produces lactate even when the tissues are perfectly well oxygenated. Furthermore, we must account for impaired tissue metabolism and reduced clearance. Mitochondrial dysfunction, often caused by drug toxicity or the cytopathic hypoxia seen in severe sepsis, prevents the cell from utilizing available oxygen. Additionally, the liver is responsible for approximately 70% of lactate clearance. In patients with hepatic failure, a high lactate level may simply reflect a clogged drain rather than a leaking faucet. Pitfall number two, relying on isolated values. A single static lactate measurement of 4.0 millimoles per liter tells us very little about a patient's trajectory. A major pitfall is reacting to an isolated value without assessing longitudinal trends, often referred to as lactate clearance. Research indicates that the rate of change is a much stronger predictor of mortality than the initial value. We should look for a decrease of at least 10 to 20 percent every two to four hours during active resuscitation. If the lactate remains static or rises despite our interventions, we must reassess our diagnosis rather than simply increasing fluid administration. Pitfall number three, neglecting clinical correlation. We often fall into the trap of treating the monitor instead of the patient. An elevated lactate must always be correlated with other bedside markers of perfusion. A patient with a lactate of 3.5 millimoles per liter who has a capillary refill time of less than 3 seconds, warm extremities, and adequate urine output of at least 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour may not require further aggressive fluid resuscitation. Physical exam findings, such as the skin modeling score or the temperature of the knees, provide immediate data on microcirculatory status. When the biochemical data and the physical exam are discordant, the clinician must pause. Over-resuscitating a patient solely based on a lab value can lead to fluid overload and increased morbidity. Pitfall number four, rigid normalization targets. The final pitfall is the pursuit of normal at any cost. While the standard reference range ends at 2.0 millimoles per liter, forcing every patient to this target can be harmful. In certain chronic conditions or during high-dose vasopressor therapy, achieving a lactate below 2.0 millimoles per liter may be physiologically impossible. Using rigid normalization targets often leads to the overuse of fluids and pressors, which carries risks like pulmonary edema and myocardial strain. Our goal should be the stabilization of the full clinical picture, blood pressure, mental status, and organ function, rather than the single-minded pursuit of a normal number. 
Conclusion In summary, lactate is a powerful but non-specific marker. We must differentiate between oxygen delivery issues and metabolic issues, prioritize trends over single data points, and always integrate our findings with a thorough physical examination. By avoiding these common pitfalls, we can provide more precise and safer care for our most vulnerable patients.